This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Returning to the podcast for episode 65 is Jungian analyst, author, and teacher, Dr. James Hollis in Washington, D.C. After receiving a doctorate in literature from Drew University, he taught humanities and the philosophic traditions of cultures for 26 years before training as a Jungian analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich. Dr. Hollis is the co-founder and first director of training of the Philadelphia Jung Institute and served for many years as executive director of the C.G. Jung Educational Center of Houston, Texas. He then relocated to Washington, D.C., where he became the executive director of the Jung Society of Washington and now serves on their board of directors. He is currently a senior training analyst for the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts and is vice president emeritus of the Philemon Foundation, a group of scholars, board members, and donors who share the mandate to prepare the unpublished works of C.G. Jung. Dr. Hollis is the author of 16 books and has joined us on this podcast for three previous episodes, episode 25 on his book, Why Good People Do Bad Things, Understanding Our Darker Selves, episode 27 on his book, The Eden Project, In Search of the Magical Other, and in episode 32 on his book, Living an Examined Life, Wisdom for the Second Half of the Journey. He returns to the podcast today to discuss his new book, Living Between Worlds, Finding Personal Resilience in Changing Times, published this week by Sounds True. Please visit our website, speakingofjung, that's J-U-N-G, dot com, where you'll find links to all of Dr. Hollis's books, as well as more information on his online video courses offered by the Jung Society of Washington. You can help support this podcast by registering through our links for any of the five video courses with Dr. Hollis, including The Interpretation of Dreams and Creating a Life, Living in the Intersection of Fate, Character, and Choice. You can start these courses anytime, go at your own pace, and enjoy lifetime access to the material. Please visit speakingofjung.com for full details. This interview is being recorded on Monday, June 22nd, 2020, through the magic of Skype. Hi, Dr. Hollis. Hello, Laura. It's good to be with you. Over the years, I've attended various lectures that you've given, the first one being in 2001, and I still refer to those notes. I've seen you in Columbus, here in Chicago, and in Dallas, and this is your fourth episode of Speaking of Young. And I would like to take a few minutes before we get into the new book to talk about you and how you became interested in Young, because I was looking through all of the photos that I have of you um, to post on Facebook and Instagram and to include with this episode on YouTube. The only photo of us together was taken in Dallas in 2013. You speak there every year at the C.G. Jung Society of North Texas, and you told the story of how you first encountered Jung's work. And what I realized is that I had never asked you about that on this podcast. So I was hoping that today you would share with us that story about your first encounter with Jung's work. Well, certainly. I think I was about 19, maybe, maybe possibly 20. And that's back when uh, so many courses were required. And I had an introduction to sociology course required. And uh, frankly, I found the subject very, very boring. Um, and, and we were, I was sitting in the back of the class, I was very quiet, very respectful, so I know that I wasn't uh, obstreperous in any way or problematic, but one day the instructor called me up after class and said, um, you know, why don't you do an um, independent study? And I said, what's an independent study? You know, I, I was really adrift in college up to that point. And he explained to me, and I said, you mean I don't have to come to class? <laughs> <laughs> thrilled with that prospect. And he said, yeah, you go out and find a subject and you write a paper and bring it to me and that will satisfy your credits here. And to this day, I still don't know why he did that. 
because it was uh, you know just one of those acts of the gods, I guess. So I literally had no thought about what what should I be writing about. I have no idea, and because um, we'd been spending a lot of time on what's a family and you know what's a society and important stuff, but it just didn't connect to me. So I, I walked into the library. I literally was going up and down the shelves looking for an idea. You know, it's almost like, please send me an idea. And nothing spoke to me. So I walked into the campus bookstore, and there was a, a, a book cover with a face. And I actually have it at my elbow here. I've kept it all these years. Oh, do you? <clears throat> I, it cost a massive 95 oh. cents. time, And I literally had to borrow some money from a friend to purchase <laughs> But I looked at that face, and I looked at the subject matter, and um, I thought, that's what I'm interested in. And the subject title of the book was uh, Psychology and Religion, and it was um, Jung's three lectures at Yale at the um, uh, series that they were running, and it was in 1937. That face and that title leaped out at me, and I thought for the first time, this is something I'm interested in because it was really about what you know, what means anything. Why are we here in service to what? It was about the problem of meaning, and I thought, oh, that's what really I'm interested in. And and so I read it. I wrote my my paper, got a passing mark with it, and I'm sure I didn't understand much of what Jung was saying at that point because it was totally new to me. Mm-hmm. But it was the beginning of a process, and uh, I was enough impressed with Jung in my readings uh, through then and graduate school that I actually used the Jungian lens in writing a dissertation on Yeats uh, a few years later. Uh, But up to that point, it had still been academic. And it was only at midlife, I was literally 35 years old, that I experienced... um, a real depression. I, I'd sort of achieved all the goals I thought I was supposed to achieve and uh, was enjoying at some level the experience of all of them and at the same time something was missing. So I went into um, therapy for the first time in Philadelphia and that would have been 1975 and um, to his everlasting credit, the person I was seeing was a psychiatrist, and after a few sessions, he said, you know, the kinds of things you're interested in, you really ought to talk to a Jungian. There is one in this area. And at that point, um, an analyst by the name of David Hart, who has since passed away, was the only analyst between uh, Washington, D.C. And, and New York City. So I started seeing him, and as soon as he said that, I thought, well, of course, it was, I'd forgotten. Mm was the one psychologist that addressed the real issues that I was most interested in. And I would say just by by way of summation, um, you know, Jung said more people suffer from disconnects from meaning than any other cause of their suffering. And it's something that I have certainly observed as an analyst through the years. Little did I know at that time I was starting a whole different uh, journey at midlife. It was appropriate, but um, two years later then I was in Zurich studying and at that time had no intention of leaving academia, but I wound up ultimately uh, coming back to the United States and and practicing as an analyst. And while I'm still a teacher, I I did leave academia and, um, you know, it was all as if there were certain voices within that were clamoring, but, um, you, you know, it's so easy to override them when we're young. Mm. In later years, they begin to um, be more insistent, or or maybe they begin to be um, something that we now are ready to hear. You know, the old Chinese saying, the person who speaks the right word will be heard a thousand miles away, and I think so it was with, with you. Mm-hmm. And in chapter three of the new book, you mention why you left your career as a teacher of literature and the philosophic traditions of cultures to study psychology. So you were in Zurich uh, for six years. Mm -hmm. And something else we haven't discussed is who you trained with and who you analyzed with. Um, I was really happy to see in a couple places in the new book, you mentioned Marion Woodman. And I wasn't even aware that you two may have been in Zurich at the same time? No, actually, she was um, ahead of me. Okay. 
I only met her later years when I was um, hosting her at the uh, Jung Center of Houston. You say, actually, in the afterword of the new book, that Zurich was the place of a midlife passage. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by that? Well, in every passage, something has died or is, is, has grown stultified and no longer capable of guiding you through the terrain in which you find yourself. And there's often this terrible in-between. And for me, the Zurich experience was the terrible in-between. I was, I was forcing, I was forced to face um, a number of ideas I had and uh, I think a number of reflexive protections I had. And uh, it's a deconstruction process. It's never, never uh, pleasant. But out of that came, I think, a, a deepened sense of connection to the self with a capital S, a mm -hmm. deepened sense of uh, access. Because as Jung said, and I, I think about this every day, he said, we all need to find what supports us when nothing supports us. So it was a very difficult time for me. It was it was time when I was flying back and forth to my family back in America, although at times they could join me. It was a time of um, isolation, time of, of great privation. But it was also, I think, a time of dedication to something that had to be addressed. Um, Jung himself writes in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, uh, life has addressed a question to me and I myself am a question. So I think that's what I was experiencing in my life too. And, and the question that life had addressed to me is, you know, but, but who are you really apart from your roles, apart from whatever you do in the world? And why are you here and in service to what? Um, and those are helpful questions. Those are questions that open doors. But when you're going through the deconstruction of your old sense of self and, and your sort of roadmap, uh, it's hardly a pleasant experience. And something else that you mention in the new book is that we're still trying to make the old way work. Quite difficult to let go of the old and create a new way. Is that kind of what you were doing in Zurich? Why that was a passage? Sure, sure. But it was it was not a choice. It was yeah, something right. that was being engineered by the self. That's why Jung said, and this is again something I think about every day, he said, encounters with the self, capital S, are usually felt as defeats for the ego. Mm -hmm. That's why passages are often conflictual and, and painful processes. Uh, and, and yet, it's, it's the psyche's engineering that's bringing this about. In other words, something in us is critiquing the life we're living, the assemblage of roles and expectations and, and value systems. And that autonomous um, challenge that rises from below is actually something profound. And, and the last thing would, that would occur to us at the moment is, well, how do I turn and pay attention to that? Because I'm still dealing with the world out there. You know, the first half of life, to speak very generally here, is what is the world asking of me and how do I meet the world's demands upon me? But then you begin to realize, but there are demands coming from inside too. And that's, that's a different kind of uh, summons. And it, we can flee it, and I think many folks do. In fact, we live in a culture where the chief treatment plan for this summons is distraction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to sort of plug in and tune in and, and, and ignore but then where does, where does the question go in our life? Something inside can sicken and sour when we haven't turned to address what is wanting expression through us. So you say that there's something within us that knows what's right for us. And if that's the case, and I believe it is, then how effective can the popular forms of therapy really be? I mean, I'd like to know how what you do as a Jungian analyst differs in working with a client to to find that within themselves as opposed to my one of my pet peeves is giving advice or life coaches that put you on this this plan that's already kind of standardized. Mhm. Mm well, I would say I think I and most Jungian analysts are actually eclectic. There are times when we're addressing certain 
problems in a person's life. And uh, the approaches of behaviorism and cognitive psychology may be useful in addressing those problems. Um, but problems easily solved are, are often, in the long run, trivial and not that important. Mm-hmm. The real issue is who are you and, and what is your life calling you to? Now, that's not necessarily what brings people in, although it might be bringing them in at a deeper unconscious level. Mm-hmm. Jung said once, um, virtually everybody he ever worked with at some level knew what their task was, but were afraid of knowing what it was or, or didn't want to know or had enormous resistance to it. Because the most important thing I learned in my time of, in analysis in, in Zurich was what you've become may now be your greatest problem, which is a very paradoxical kind of statement. In other words, what do we become? A series of respondings, a series of reflexive, um, you know, <laughs> encounters with the world. Uh, we internalize instructions, we, we adapt, we, ma- we make plans. And we become a functional self. And if a person hasn't done that in the first half of life, then he or she still has some unfinished business. But then you see, we wouldn't have to be very conscious in any given moment in life because we have all of these reflexive responses to life. So one one could sort of live this journey unconsciously and perhaps serve out the length of one's life without ever stopping and, and asking but who am I apart from these respondings, these reflexive engagements with the world? And again, if there weren't symptomatology, in other words, if something inside weren't protesting, um, chances are most of our lives would be on automatic pilot. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened to me at midlife. And I didn't realize it at the moment, but I was gifted by the fact that my psyche was autonomously withdrawing approval and support from where the ego world, under the influence of complexes, was investing its energy. So your new book is being released tomorrow, June 23rd, 2020. It's titled Living Between Worlds, Finding Personal Resilience in Changing Times. And it's your 16th book, and I have all of them, uh, except I should say for the book you published in 1970, titled Harold Pinter, The Poetics of Silence. Did you publish that when you were in school? Uh, Just after I left graduate school, yes. And um, that was that was um, an interesting book. I had been uh, educated in northern New Jersey at the time in graduate school and um, had the privilege of seeing some wonderful uh, plays in Manhattan that were there at the time, uh, Beckett and Pinter and Albee and Tennessee Williams. It was a very rich time for the theater. Mm -hmm. I was moved by this person, Pinter, um, and yet found nothing written about him. He was unknown, basically, outside of Manhattan at that. So that was the first book that was written about Pinter in America. There was one book written about him in in England, but uh, so it was right at the beginning. And the role of the book was to introduce him to the American public. And it was subtitled the, the Poetics of Silence because this is a person who create tension by silence. Um, he, he would exploit the pauses we make between words. He would um, suggest in some way or trigger in us, I should say, uh, our own projections, our own apprehensions. And so there was often a kind of tension uh, going on beneath the subject that's being discussed by the characters on the stage. So I found him really very psychologically appealing. That is so interesting to me. It's reminding me of, I did a listener roundtable episode at the end of last year. I had some longtime listeners of this podcast on as my guests. And one of them, a novelist in Yorkshire in England, his name is Michael Walters, He's very interested in Jung, and he talked about the kind of therapy his first therapist practice was she wouldn't say anything. He would sit down, and I I don't know what it's called. I didn't know it was a thing, and it was complete complete silence. So he would do the talking, and she wouldn't respond. She wouldn't say anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of that? 
Um, yes, actually, David Hart was, I, I don't know that it was a theory of his. I think he was just a profound introvert, but uh, he would speak very little during our sessions. I found it exasperating at yeah. times. <laughs> I was for engagement with him, but usually he had one or two sentences per session that were golden, and I'd walk away reflecting. Mm. So it, was, it was very valuable. Mm -hmm. So you open the new book with three quotes. One is by Tomas Tronstromer. Uh, my Swedish pronunciation, I'm sure, is off. And the quote is, you'll never be complete, and that's the way it should be. Inside you, one vault after another opens endlessly. Don't be ashamed to be a human being. Be proud. Uh -huh. Yeah. And that reminds me of that often used quote that nothing human is alien to me. I still have seen it attributed to various different people. And that is one of my major takeaways from my analysis is that I'm human and I'm not perfect and I have all the things that go along with being human, which no one had ever said to me before. And it's taken me a very long time and I'm sure I'm not done to accept my humanness. Sure. Well, I think one of the most pernicious complexes most of us receive is the notion of perfection <clears throat> that we're somehow to aspire to a certain model. And since all of us fall short, um, there's often a sense of personal failure, even shame. And, and most people do not have a good opinion of themselves. They won't necessarily tell you that, but mm -hmm. that's a fact of life. And, and, you know, that's why Jung said our task is not goodness, it's, it's wholeness. And I, I thought uh, when I first heard that, I wish somebody had said that to me in uh, childhood. It would have made a big difference in my yeah. life because it would have allowed me to start accepting myself better. By, by accepting, we don't necessarily mean you have to approve everything that comes out of you, but you also have to say it's part of our, our humanity. That's why I think the great world religions had to invent concepts like confession and grace, because everyone falls short of these impossible standards. I've always loved Tillich's definition of grace, where he says, accept the fact that you're accepted, despite the fact that you're unacceptable. In the preface of the book, you mentioned something that I've never, I've never heard you say before. You say that some good folks have disliked my books because they are too dark, don't talk very much about happiness, and never mention joy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true. I mean, I've gotten <laughs> my share of negative reviews. Oh. So along the way, where, where people think the vision there is dark. And I, I've never thought of them as dark. I've always mm -hmm. thought of them as, as realistic. I mean, you know, if you, if you do the work I do, you share people's suffering and you share the reality of their life journey. So, um, you know, it's like nothing wrong with being happy. I'm not against happiness, I want to assure you. But, but the notion that one could be happy as a kind of steady state is, is delusional. Happiness is the byproduct of being in right relationship with your own soul at any given moment. And those moments are fleeting. And those moments um, are not things we can force. The more one pursues that, the more one's life is likely to become either trivialized on the one hand or compulsive on the other hand. And you, and you become in some way ensnared in that fantasy. Rather, live, live the journey as faithfully as you can, and from time to time, in the strangest of places, you may be filled with happiness. I'm happy to do my work, even though I don't enjoy it, mm -hmm. and that's the paradox. I enjoy human suffering. I don't enjoy conflict, but um, this is the reality of human experience, so it, I, it, I'm, I'm happy that I'm able to engage it in a way that I've found more meaningful than, you know, early life of living in, in um, academia. There seems to be a lot of pressure on us to be happy. That phrase, I just want you to be happy, or somebody pointing out she's not happy, or suggesting that you stop doing something, well, if it doesn't make you happy. Is that a superficial life? I mean, that that's a lot of pressure. And I 
I don't put those expectations on myself. I, if I'm not smiling, there's usually someone who wants to point that out. So this expectation and this pressure of happiness, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. And um, actually, I'm going to be having a Tibetan Buddhist Geshe Larampa on the podcast next week on one of my quarantine episodes. And I want to talk to him about what the Tibetan Buddhists really mean when they say that the purpose of life is to be happy and that happiness is their religion, because I don't think they're using the word happiness like we do. No, I don't think so either. I, I think what they're talking about is the uh, sort of goal of a process whereby the ego's grasping is transcended mm. and the, and accept the world as it is with a sense of joy, trying to rather than trying to engineer it in, in ways which are congenial to our ego desires. So in a, in a certain way, it would be transcending those desires and, and not being ensnared by them and captivated by them. So I'd like to go through the chapters in the book. There mm -hmm. are nine of them. And the first chapter is titled, When the Old Map Disappears, and you begin with a quote by Jung, every transformation demands, as its precondition, the ending of a world, the collapse of an old philosophy of life. And I feel like we're going through that right now, as mm -hmm. a society, as a world. Sure. Well, one of the points I try to make in, the, in those first chapters is, that itself is not new. History is full of eras ending. It's yes. full of plague times. It's, it's full of moments when the old order is exhausted. And then you have those in-between times, you know, where the center cannot hold, to use Yeats's phrase. And, and yes, we are going through one of those. And one of the themes that's uh, particularly interested me is over the last two centuries, the erosion of the powerful connectors previous civilizations had to the great orders of mystery in our life, such as the nature of the cosmos. Why are we here? Who are the gods? Our relationship to nature, which we know we've really violated, and the nature of our own belonging, our tribal needs, and the nature of our own individual journeys. So when, when a person lives in a culture where there are energy-laden images that connect people in meaningful ways, to those mysteries, then, then they're gifted because they have a sense of participation in something larger than just their individual biographies. They have a sense of um, identity and, and psycho-spiritual location or locus. Uh, when, when that erodes, as has happened particularly over the last couple of centuries, uh, then, then we find ourselves uh, adrift, uh, full of malaise, and subject to addictions and distractions and uh, all kinds of uh, causes and, and, and so forth. As Matthew Arnold put it in the 19th century, we, we wander between two worlds, one dead, the other powerless to be born. And so that is, that is our condition. And this is why Jung said at the end of the 19th century, uh, deaf psychology had to be invented because he said, Heretofore, the um, issues that need, people needed to address were addressed by tribal mythology, mm -hmm. by uh, great institutions, all of which have lost for many, for tens of millions of people, uh, not for all, but for most people, uh, its connective powers. Chapter two is titled Life in the Between. And the the part that stood out to me is when you're talking about Camus and in his novel, The Fall, says that everyone gets excited and pleased when there's a scandal. And I'm seeing that right now. I'm noticing that. Um, the violence, it, you say violence appeals because it shatters the constrictive, predictive deadness of normality. How would you apply that to what we're seeing in the news right now? Well, you know, <laughs> Uh, Camus in the fall, they said how wonderful it is there's a murder in the neighborhood because mm -hmm. but it lifts everybody up out of the ordinary, breaks the routine and, mm -hmm. and lifts them into a, a kind of momentary transcendent realm. And so it is in times of great conflict and, and social change and, and so forth. And, and you pointed out in a, a talk he gave in 1939, he said, you know, people are clamoring for war. 
He said, because they want to stand in relationship to something larger than they are. There's a deep emotional need to do that, although, you know, the war that was to come was so horrible and so destructive. But still, he said, such is the enthusiasm with which people will seek it. And are you seeing that today? Of course, of course. You know, we're having large paradigms and, and social conventions uh, sort of uh, challenged and some, some areas shattered. You know, when I was a child, there <clears throat> for my parents, and of course I was raised in this atmosphere, there were very fixed sort of categories of belief. I mean, one of them being uh, gender roles, for example, what a man supposed to do and be and what a woman was supposed to do and be and these things were thought to come either from nature or from the acts of divinity and what we now understand since the 60s onward is that there are social constructions and social constructions arise out of human psychology and can be challenged and deconstructed and that's that's what's happening and you know the stories we have about um, the races is a perfect example of how, you know, people have been caught in certain kinds of fantasies which are now being challenged. And you know, I was just reading in the Washington Post this morning about the conflict it's producing between generations and so many contemporary families where parents were raised with one set of images and expectations and, and their, their children are emerging to a different society. And one person said, I thought quite eloquently, um, if we say we're we're being sensitive to people maybe it's we have to be sensitive to our parents too because they're going through the erosion of a world they thought they knew and whenever the world we thought we knew is eroding we're in a passage whether we know it or not the third chapter is titled what is depth psychology and why does it matter and just as an aside i noticed that you use the term depth psychology and not Jung's analytical psychology, and was wondering if there was a reason for that? Well, it was simply to say uh, depth psychology can be practiced by more than Jungians. Okay. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, and depth psychology is an effort to engage the unconscious. And of course, the problem with the unconscious, as we all know, is that it's unconscious, so we can't speak of it. So we, we have to then work with our symptoms, work with the patterns that we have in our life and ask from whence have they come, uh, work with our dreams and so forth in order to begin to dialogue with the invisible world that uh, we all carry within us. And that's why so much of contemporary psychology that's practiced out there, with all due respect, uh, is also in many ways superficial. You know, it's problem oriented, which can be very helpful. But in the long run, if a person's looking for genuine growth and transformation, um, those, those behavioral techniques are not going to take you very far. This chapter is where you discuss psychopathology. What is psychopathology? Well, if we take it apart etymologically, psyche is the Greek word for soul. Logos is word or expression of. And um, pathos is a Greek word for suffering. So psychopathology means literally the expression of the suffering of the soul. And the moment you think about that, the moment that is your lens, then it changes everything. We're not just our behaviors. We're not just our mental processes. And we're not just our biologies. We're, we're meaning-seeking, meaning-creating animals. And we suffer deeply when the structures and belief systems in which we find ourselves are not congruent with the intentions of, of our own soul. And, and that uh, incongruous is going to, incongruity is going to produce symptomatology. So rather than say, how quickly do we get rid of these symptoms, we have to ask, why have they come? What are they asking of us? And what changes have to occur? in order that the relationship with one's own soul is repaired. And, and is that a luxury to be asking ourselves those questions, or is that a real necessity? Is that the only way that we can get to the bottom of what ails us? Well, I wouldn't for a moment want to forget that for many people, just having food today is their chief priority. Mm -hmm nor should I, you know, ignore at all 
the fact that most people have very few choices in their lives. So in that sense, you could say it's a luxury. But on the other hand, what questions are more important in your life than addressing, you know, what is really wanting expression through you? Because, again, the first half of life is about what does the world want of me and how do I mobilize the resources to meet that? But second half of life, the question is, what does the soul want? And and, and what is wanting to come into the world through me, which may or may not be congruent with my ego comfort? It may not. That can cause cause me to change or grow or develop or, or leave some safe structures. So that's not an easy question, but it's a question in which I think our our engagement with our own soul it sort of challenges and I think qualitatively affects the journey that we are all here to live. In the next chapter, chapter four, you outline the what you call the three essential principles of depth psychology. The first being, it's not about what it's about. The second, what you see is a compensation for what you don't see. And the third, all is metaphor. And in that first section, you mentioned the letter exchange between Jung and the founder of AA, Bill W., mm-hmm. in It's Not About What It's About. Well, yes. I mean, again, that's, that's recognizing the limitations of behavioral and cognitive and pharmacological therapy, again, as important as they may be, that many times what we're really addressing is is we're, we're addressing the symptomatology without understanding what's the nature of the conflict from which that is arising within the psyche of that individual and the famous exchange between bill w and um, <clears throat> jung had to do with jung pointing out to him he said you know in, in a certain way the the problem of alcoholism is is uh, the search for spirits after all and he said it's it's literalizing something I mean, when you think of all the food disorders we have, the same is true there, that, that food is not just fuel in the tank. It's what kind of projections do we have upon it? Mm. And the same is true in so many areas of co- obsessive ideas that people have. What they really are are kind of literalizations of what is the deep emotional need within that person. And the second part, what you see is a compensation for what you don't see. Sure. The, the psyche is always seeking balance. It's, it's seeking growth and healing. And as our outer pressures and our own ego attitudes push us to one side of our personalities, so the psyche has to start lobbying for other aspects of the personality. And so much of what happens in psychopathology is compensation. So, for example, I may have a, a certain behavior by day certain reinforced pattern Uh, and at night my dreams uh, critique that and so where are those dreams coming from well it's the the activity of the psyche to compensate and to bring things back towards the center of the operations of the psyche it's the one-sidedness of the psyche that is our our neurosis and then all is metaphor is that the symbolic life yes yes in other words the the key here is the ability to read these things symbolically. Mm-hmm. I've always been moved by Paul Elwar, the surrealist poet uh, early in the 20th century, saying once there is another world, and it is Nisiwin. And, you know, that's again the limitations of simply focusing on the behaviors. Uh, you know, the diagnostic and statistical manual that's sort of the Bible of therapists across the, the country, even the world, describes behaviors, symptoms, uh, and so forth, but it never asks the question, why have they come? What are they asking of us? How is it we might dialogue with that, pay attention to that? And and that's sort of the sort of emptiness of so much modern psychology that's all in service to the ego's desire for sovereignty and, and dominance, rather than seeing the ego as needing from time to time to submit to the soul in terms of what is what is it that my own soul is asking of me. So it's not about dominance, it's, it's about being in a healthy relationship with the inner life. And in chapter five, you look at some case studies in the search for personal resilience. You look at Antigone, Hamlet, 
and proof rock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, because I, I've always felt, you know, Aristotle said once that the uh, artist is more faithful to history than the historian, and he meant by that the historian will deal with specific facts and, and nonetheless be interpreting those facts, of course. But he said the artist is always trying to express the universal. So all three of those characters, Antigone, Hamlet, and J. Alfred Prufrock by Eliot, are characters who are in the in-between. Mm -hmm. They're not between claims upon them, as Antigone is. Or Hamlet's, in some way, the portrait of the first modern. He knows what he wants to do, what he needs to do, but for reasons he doesn't know, uh, he can't do it. As he says, till resolution is sicklied over with the pale cast of thought and lose the name of action. Well, from the 17th century, that's a perfect description of a complex. And uh, Eliot's Prufrock is, again, a, a person who continuously has aspirations to break out of his... Um, of his sense of self, but its its power is so great, he he stays stuck being who, who he is. It's a portrait of stuckness and the agony of knowing that one is stuck and yet not finding the courage, resolve, and uh, sort of endurance necessary uh, to get out of that. So I, I, I thought rather than focus on individual cases of which, you know, there are so many, mm -hmm. uh, here are three paradigms, if you will of, uh, you know, the human in-betweenness that occurs to us all the time. I love what you say about Hamlet, that he endures in our imagination because his stuckness is so familiar. He is caught between complexes and that his problem, often ours as well, is that he knows what is right for him, what he has been called to do, but for reasons he knows not, he does not so act. And you say that he is so familiar to us because he knows, he really knows that he is his own worst problem, as do we. He knows he is stuck with himself, as do we, and that no amount of blaming others, no whining, no petitioning the gods will spare him from himself. And the next chapter, chapter six, what is healing? That's a very interesting question. I thought this was a very interesting chapter. Would you say a little bit about what you came up with or what you determine what healing is? Well, sure. Healing is a mystery. I mean, if I break my arm, I mean, physicians can set the bone and try to maximize the conditions for healing, but nature heals, not the physician. And the same is true of psychotherapy. Um, you know, this is not a disease we're addressing. This is a human process. Mm -hmm. So healing is, that's why I said, there, there are two motives to the psyche, as far as I can tell. It's continued growth and development on the one hand, but on the other hand, healing, the many splits that we have. And healing is a mysterious process. So I can, I can say definitively, having learned the hard way, healing is a direct function of our capacity to listen to pay attention. I mean, that's what the word therapy means from the Greek, therapoiein, to listen or attend. So when we listen to the psyche, that's psychotherapy, then, you know, whether we're seeing another person or doing it with ourselves, then there's the possibility of, of the ego choices uh, aligning more fully with, with the intentionality of the psyche. Because, again, this is not about adaptation to the world. That's, that's the first half of life. Every child has to make adaptations. But the deeper the adaptation, the deeper the split within the child. Mm -hmm. so the healing process means, all right, but what if I begin to pay attention to what is wishing expression through me and, and coming to me through my dreams, symptoms, the feeling function, energy systems, and, and most of all, the experience of meaning? Then I began to realize, okay, there's another consciousness, there's another will, there's another intelligence at work within me. And, you know, at some level the child knew it, but was unable to enact it in the world, given its powerlessness and its dependency. But in some way we have to come back to that. What is right for us will come to us if we pay attention. Then you face... Mm -hmm. And you, in a sense, find the courage to live that in the world. What is right for us will come to us if we pay attention. 
Over time. Over time. Yeah. Chapter seven is titled The Maiden with No Hands, a Psychomythic Interlude on Gender. What I pulled from that chapter is you say we are currently witnessing the rise of compensatory energies to the one sidedness of history. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In other words, <clears throat> just as we can be neurotic, by which we mean caught in our complexes and, and split against our own best interests, so cultures can be. Mm. So in, in looking at that familiar tale from the Grimm's collection, The Maiden with No Hands, I, I look at it from as if it were the portrait of, of a woman who has been abused by the patriarchal system. Then I look at it the, at the psyche of a man who has been abused by the patriarchal system and see how intuitively, um, wherever this tale emerged from the sort of collective imagination of the Middle Ages, that even then you could see the compensatory function of the psyche trying to rise and heal the wounds that are coming from the culture and its one-sided assumptions. So in looking at both from the standpoint of a woman and from the standpoint of a man, you can see, oh, well, this tale is really timeless because I've been raised in that same kind of culture. I, too, have suffered these same kinds of splittings inside. And I, too, now have some intimation as to where healing can come from me. The next chapter, chapter eight, is titled Navigating Changing Times. And you, I think the main theme of this chapter is the numinous. You say that Jung meant that the solution to life's dilemmas is through an encounter with the numinous. And I would just like to add this is in this chapter, you talk about your son who passed away uh, several years ago, and you include a poem that he wrote, which I highly recommend uh, everybody get this book just to read that poem it really touched me. It's called Naming Storms. And mm -hmm. would you say a little bit about that? Well, um, it's hard to um, talk about it without being full of tears because I miss him greatly. Um, he was one of my best friends. But I, I talk there about how um, he was a person who I think almost lived in a, a, a different psychology, in a different world. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things I enjoyed, he lived in Santa Fe. We were able to have conversations as we walked in, you know, through these primal forests and the mountains and so forth around Santa Fe. And, and you know, from that, um, a, a sense in which, you know, you put it this way. He said, life is a short pause between two great mysteries. Now, that's a pretty good definition of life. Yeah. And, you know, it is a short pause, too short from the ego standpoint. Mm -hmm. So we have to ask ourselves, all right, if I'm surrounded by mystery, <laughs> the mystery of each other, the mystery of nature, the mystery of this journey, well, let me take that seriously and still be in the concrete world. This is not about separating daily life. It's, it's saying, how do I allow that sense a participation in something deeper than just filling my days with with trivial news and so forth that um, I, 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 I'm in some way engaging in the depth of this journey you know we're not a disease we're a, a journey to be lived and the question is again what is life asking of me and how am I to to respond to it so I, um, I, I think of my son as one of the few people I know who was living his journey in a way that made sense to him. Mm -hmm. And so simple, but it's not cost free, I can tell you. Yes, that's really beautiful. And the last chapter, chapter nine, is titled A Map to Meaning, What We Can Learn from Jung. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Jung is one of those um, geniuses that um, sort of like Geopetto's elves will creep in at night and change the typography of a book and, oh. and, he, and he realized, oh, I didn't realize he said that or, right. or I understand that now this mm -hmm. this sense of something that happened to me yesterday so uh, he his his imagination was of such a magnitude that he keeps inspiring people not as a guru because the essence of Jungian psychology is to turn people back to themselves, yeah. to 
No, not in isolation. This is not about narcissism or withdrawal. It's to say, all right, but if you really want to have some sense of, um, of guidance in your life, you better start looking within because that's where it's going to be found. I, I've always been moved by um, Emily Dickinson's aphorism from 1862 where she, she said, the sailor cannot see the north but knows the needle can. And what she's saying there is, you know, if you're out in the high seas, as we all are, you better have a compass. And for many, you know, traditional mythology was their compass. For most moderns and postmoderns, the compass is within. And you better know that you have one. And if you don't, you're really going to be in trouble here. So if you have a compass, you can thread your way through the shoals and reefs of life and, and find where you need to go. And after chapter nine, you end with an afterword called homecoming. And you talk about the meaning of the word home, and I'll leave that to the reader. But you conclude by saying we will always live in in between times. So it's not something that, for instance, what we're in right now that we can't just sort of want to make it hurry up and be over with, that we always live in in between times. Well, always, first of all, at the, at the cultural level, there's something always gnawing away at the collective belief systems, and, and already its, its end is, is for, forecast at some level. But intrapsychically, you know, life has changed. The nature of nature is change and growth and development. And the mature ego can, can ride those waves of change. The immature ego cannot. That's one of the sources of the deep split in our culture at this point, those who can adapt to change, which is already happening. It's not as if it might happen, it's already happening. And, and, and those who, who cannot, and those who cannot will of course engage in regressive movements of all kinds, is what For, Freud called the regressive restoration of the persona. Let's, let's just go back to the way things were. Well, the way things were, 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 were was miserable. Many human beings, uh, minorities and women and many others suffered enormously under the old systems and they are rightly being challenged. And so that's true intrapsychically as well. Whatever I think today, um, you know, the psyche will have moved on by tomorrow. And that's why, that's why we have to somehow be nimble in, uh, in working with these changes intrapsychically because, and one good example of that is the aging process. Mm -hmm. You know, the ego is not thrilled to learn it's mortal. It's not thrilled with aging. It's not thrilled with illness. And yet these are part of the nature of nature. So the question is, how do I respond when those inevitable, you know, <laughs> sort of inherent changes uh, take over? The body changes, our society changes, our understandings change. And pity the poor ego that's saying, but I want what I want when I want it. Mm -hmm. And I have the world as I've often thought it might be, well, that's a person who's going to find increasingly his or her life, again, trivialized or, or caught in, in some kind of fugitive, fugitive existence. And that's not a pretty picture when you think about it. I'd like to end by bringing up another one of your books. I think that your book why Good People Do Bad Things. I know you're not happy with that title. Uh, the subtitle is Understanding Our Darker Selves. To me, that's the greatest book ever written. But the first book of yours that I read, I'm holding it here in my hands. It's called Creating a Life, Finding Your Individual Path. And it was published in 2001. I remember purchasing this at the bookstore at the C.G. Jung Center in Evanston, which is just north of Chicago. And they used to have this beautiful bookstore that doesn't exist any longer. But I, I bought the book and we got back in the car to drive home and I started reading it right away. And there's no introduction. There's no preface. It just starts with chapter one, creating a life, the necessity of personal myth. And each of the paragraphs, the short paragraphs, begin with the older I get, the more, and you continue. And you also add some of some flashbacks 
to your childhood. And like I said, this was the first book of yours that I had read. And that is when I knew that this was the path, the work for me, because of somebody such as yourself, I, you know, you've got this PhD from the Jung Institute in Zurich, could write what you wrote in this chapter. You're, you, I I still don't know how to put this into words, but you are human and so am I, and you are one of us. And this, I know I'm not saying this very well, and I'll probably edit this out, but this chapter changed everything for me because it just made me realize that I'm just like you, you're just like me, and you got where you got, and I can get better too. I I don't know what I'm trying to say here. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to bring this up, but this line, decades later, he stands in the shower and weeps, the only safe place where tears are indistinguishable from shampoo. And I still remember when I read that and how that just, that it just changed something, something in me shifted after I read that one sentence. So I don't know what I was trying to say there. Maybe you do. I'll probably edit that out. But thank you for that book. And I want wanted to lead you, leave you with the last word. Uh, is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to say? I, I think you've covered it very well. And thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for the invitation to be with you. But um, in the original title of this book was simply In Between Times, and that's not very sexy, so that got changed in the process. But in saying In Between Times, um, again, the nature of nature and of our own psyches is change. And the ego is uh, dedicated to a fixed order and the fantasy of its own control. So something is always in some way um, slipping out from our grasp. And rather than fight that and rigidify, we have to invite the ego to say, you know, what I need to do is is dialogue with this change and and, and establish a rapprochement with that. And as I do, I will be less riven within and less symptomatic because um, that kind of dialogue, which doesn't remove us from the world, it, it, it deepens our participation in the world. Because if I don't have that, then I'm presenting a false self to my family, to my society, to my uh, committees, and so forth. And so, as, as Jung pointed out, the best thing we can do for the world out there um, is, is to address our own stuff, first of all. Because at least we're lifting, lifting that off of, um, you know, the, the world's problems. I, I've always been moved by Philo of Alexandria, who said... Um, be kind. Everyone you meet has a really big problem. And I think I said in the, the preface or towards the conclusion of this, this current book, uh, you know, we're all in this together. Yeah. Let's be kind to each other in the meantime, because uh, your brother and sister are struggling and trying to do the best they can. And they're, again, driven by their fears and, and, and um, you know, frustrations. And you know, let recognize that. Give them a break. And maybe along the way, you might give yourself a break, too. Yeah, I did notice that. It's actually in the preface. You wrote, we are all in this together, which we're seeing a lot of that statement right now. And you wrote this last year, two years ago? Yeah, it was really being written two years ago. It takes time for these books to be published. Right. So. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Hollis. It's a privilege to be with you, Laura, and I send you uh, the best wishes and uh, look forward to your future programs. Thank you so much. Please visit the website, Speaking of Jung, that's J-U-N-G, dot com for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And it will be available later in the week on our YouTube channel. You can also listen to this episode on your Amazon Echo device simply by saying, Alexa, play Speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts or TuneIn. 
Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. So with special thanks to Sounds True and to the late Daryl Sharp and everyone at Inner City Books, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung. <laughs>